Thank you for joining me for our Ash Wednesday worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. I'd like to share with you the scripture readings appointed for Ash Wednesday. The Old Testament reading from 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is when the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet Nathan, to David to point out his sin. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came and told him this. There were two men in a city. One was rich and one poor. The rich man had a large number of flocks and herds. The poor man did not own anything except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He raised it so that it, so that it grew up together with him and his children. It ate from his food and drank from his cup. It slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. When a traveler came to the rich man, the rich man was unwilling to take an animal from his flock or from his herd to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. So he took the lamb from the poor man and prepared it for the man who had come to him. David's anger flared up against that man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this is as good as dead. In place of that lamb, he will restore four lambs because he did this and had no pity. Nathan told David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave the house of your master to you and I gave you the wives of your master into your embrace. I gave you the house of Israel and the house of Judah. If this was too little, I would have added even more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his eyes? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife as your own wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. So now the sword will not depart from your house forever. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This is what the Lord says. Look, I am raising up disaster against you from your own house. Right in front of your eyes, I will take your wives and give them to your neighbor, and he will lie down with your wives in the sight of the sun. Because you acted in secret, I will do this in front of all Israel in broad daylight. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, the Lord himself has put away your sin. You will not die. Our epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses, verse 20 to chapter 6, verse 2, where Paul talks about how God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ inasmuch as God is making an appeal through us. We urge you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As fellow workers who we also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, at a favorable time, I listened to you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. Look, now is the favorable time. Now, See, now is the day of salvation. And our gospel reading is from Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. Jesus' familiar parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus told this parable to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. 
two men went up to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And I share with you now hymn number 402, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray, take all my guilt away, oh, let me from this day be holy. grace impart strength to my fainting heart my zeal inspire as thou hast died for me oh may my love to thee pure warm and changeless be a living while life's dark maze I tread and griefs around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. When ends life's transient dream, when death's cold sullen stream shall o'er me roll, bless Savior that in love fear and distrust remove Oh, bear me safe above a ransomed soul. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, purifies us from all sin. Amen. The Word of God we want to consider for this Ash Wednesday is from Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 and 4. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who are our strength and our salvation. Amen. My dear fellow sinners, whose sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. Oh, think of the time of our reading. And then he gets it. Then on that time, that's Good Friday morning, then 
Judas understands what he's really done. He suddenly realizes what he has done. Now he recognizes that he has betrayed innocent blood. Didn't Judas know well before Jesus was condemned to die like that, that he was betraying innocent blood? Didn't he know what he was doing? Well, Jesus, back in the Garden of Gethsemane, he told Judas that he was betraying the Son of Man. And when Jesus said that, Judas didn't respond by saying, no, 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 I'm not betraying an innocent man. All I'm doing is I'm procuring a product for some customers, for a buyer. He was providing Jesus for the Jewish leaders. Judas knew very well already in Gethsemane and even before that he was carrying on an act of betrayal. He knew that he was betraying innocent blood. Oh, three years of being around Jesus, that had to show him, reveal to him that Jesus was more innocent than anyone had ever been when you get right down to it. More innocent than anyone had ever been. That's why when Jesus asked Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas didn't lean into Jesus and say, yes, yes, I'm, that's what I'm doing and you deserve it. No, that's not how Judas react. Judas knew he was betraying Jesus. But finally, on that Good Friday morning, he was filled with remorse, with a terrible feeling of remorse. Finally, when Jesus was condemned to die, then Judas, who knew all along what he was doing, he seems to have really realized what he had done. Our Lent and Easter series this year looks at the crucial hours in our Savior's passion. And tonight, as we look at that crucial hour in Judas's life, we see that crucial hour when he was filled with remorse. And his negative example, when he was filled with remorse, it teaches us what to remember when you are filled with remorse. When Judas was seized with remorse, what he did is he confessed a clear understanding of his sin, and that's a good thing. But then tragically, what Jesus, Judas did is Judas found a horrible solution for his sin, which really was no solution at all. What did Judas think was going to end up happening when he betrayed Jesus for those 30 silver coins? John's Gospel tells us that Judas was a thief, and that fact provides a most likely explanation for what Judas was doing. He had seen Jesus in danger before. His enemies had come after him. And what Jesus had always done prior to this is he had mastered those circumstances. No one could lay a hand on Jesus if he didn't allow it. Maybe Judas thought that in this instance, Jesus would end up doing that again, that he would take care of things. Oh, what would happen is Jesus would be surrounded by his enemies, but then Jesus would overpower them. He would free himself. Maybe he'd freeze them in their tracks, and maybe they'd all shrivel up and die. Who knows? Judas probably thought that here what he could do is he could get some money, and he could get some money. Jesus would protect himself, and no one really would be hurt except for those Jewish leaders who would have lost some money in the deal. 
Instead, what he saw is that Judas was tried, Jesus was tried, and he was condemned. He was taken before Pontius Pilate, and soon he would be crucified. Matthew says, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. And now Matthew, he doesn't tell us that Judas was sorry for what he had done. And Matthew clearly does not use the word repent or repentance, and that's because Judas didn't repent of his sin. He did have a terrible feeling of remorse. You can't imagine the feeling of remorse that he must have had. He felt, he knew what a terrible deed he had done. He knew that it was terrible and he was afraid of what was going to happen to him, to, to Judas. He, oh, he probably felt like all of us feel when we're caught in doing something wrong. Now that money that he had received, those 30 silver coins, they looked quite different to him. What had he wanted with all that money? Was he going to buy some luxury item? Was he going to hoard that money? Well, those 30 coins in his money purse. At first, when he got them, they were probably jingling in his money purse and jingling a merry, a merry little tune for him. But now, instead of that merry tune, they were a clanging judge and jury for him, which just told him how he had sinned, how he had done wrong. And what were those coins saying now, they were saying, you're a fool, you're guilty, you've been caught, and you're going to hell for what you had done. Judas obviously was a man who had a clear understanding of his sin. He knew what he had done wrong, and his sermon that day really proves it. His sermon, those simple words, he said, I have sinned for I have betrayed an innocent man. What he did is he took his money, he took that money and tried to make a confession, those words, I have sinned. He knew he had broken God's law and if Judas knew his Old Testament as, as he probably did, he knew the verse in Deuteronomy which says, Cursed is the man who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent man. Judas knew he was guilty, and he knew what he deserved. What can we learn from Judas's terrible act? Well, Paul Harvey, he one time said, Sin always starts out being fun. Why does sin seem to so, look so attractive at first, but then turns out to be so ugly when it's done? Why was it that, you know, when Eve ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it appealed to her so much at first? Moses said, she saw that it was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. But what happened after she ate the fruit? After she ate the fruit, she felt shamefully naked and afraid. And now that same thing is true for us. Before we sin, it often seems like the thing to do. We think that we can get away with it. But then afterwards, we feel so ashamed and so foolish. And that's because, well, before we sin, Satan, oh, he's alongside us and he's whispering and he's saying, hey, it's just a little sin. Oh, maybe it's not even a sin at all. Everybody's doing it. You aren't going to hurt anybody. And go ahead, it'll be fun. 
That's how Satan comes after us and tempts us. That how, that's how he went after Judas. That's how he went after Eve. That's how he goes after us. But then after we've sinned, then Satan is still there. But he's not comforting and consoling us. Instead, he's talking aloud and he's saying, you call yourself a Christian? And you did that? It looks more to me like you're one of my children instead of one of God's children. And I suppose that you think you can just go to that wonderful God of yours and, and he's going to make everything all right. And then Satan might even say, you know, I know some scripture too. And the Bible does say the soul who sins is the one who will die. Why is it? that, oh, say for example, we get upset with somebody and we really want to give that person a piece of our mind and before we do it, it feels so right and so good and then after we've done it, we end up feeling so rotten. You know, we can all understand the sermon that Judas preached here when he said, I have sinned for I have betrayed innocent, an innocent man. Can't we understand his sermon there? Like Judas, we know we have sinned. Our sins do trouble us. And like Judas, we have those feelings of remorse that, that sometimes can be quite intense. But now, what should Judas do? What should he have done? Well, what he did is he went to the temple, he went to the chief priests and the elders from whom he had gotten his mind, his money, the ones who had collaborated with him in his crime, and he was looking to them for a solution to his sin. But what a horrible solution he ended up coming up with. If Judas had gone to the temple for comfort and for sympathy or forgiveness, he really went to the wrong source. He had gone to the wrong people because he quickly found out that they just looked at him as if he was a pawn that they were using to accomplish their own dirty business. Now that he had served their purposes, their dirty business, they wanted nothing more to do with him. But Judas came to be heard, and he wanted to say, look, I've done something wrong. I, I know I've done something wrong, but I'm not in this alone. But the chief priests and the elders, they made it clear to Judas that whatever he was feeling, they didn't care. They didn't care about him. They were having no second thoughts. But if Judas was having second thoughts, that was his own problem. They told him, what is that to us? That's your responsibility. And what a horrible solution that is to sin. That's your responsibility. But it's the typical solution that comes up with human from human reason, the ultimate, the ultimate solution that reason can compose really is this. You got yourself into this dilemma and now you have to get yourself out. Thousands of man-made religions basically end up saying that, telling us that the only comfort human reason offers a sinner is you see to it. That's your responsibility. Martin Luther, he reflected on his life as a monk when he said, I myself was a learned doctor of theology, yet I never understood. The only thing that was taught and advocated was invoke the Virgin Mary and other saints as your mediators and intercessors. Fast often and pray much. Make pilgrimages. Enter cloisters and become monks. And thus we imagined 
when we did these things, we merited heaven. Why is it? Why is it that there exists all this law way of thinking, this built-in conviction that if I have done something wrong, if I am to be right with God, I must produce it on my own. I must produce it on my own. It's because human reason can only come up with that horrible solution to the problem of sin. You see to it. That's your responsibility. And Judas, we can say here, in his own way did. When the Jewish leaders said, that's your responsibility, when they didn't care, Judas may have stood there dazed for a moment, staring at the speechless, staring at the chief priests and the elders in a, a speechless despair. They probably turned away from him and just went back to whatever it was they were doing before he came to them. They didn't want to be bothered by him. And then, then what Judas did? Well, he took those 30 coins that he had received from them. He threw them onto the floor and he ran out of God's temple and down into the valley of the Kidron Creek. And in his own opinion, there really was only one thing that he could do. His conscience so troubled him and he wanted that to stop. And maybe what he did is he took the, maybe the belt that had held that money purse around his waist, holding those wonderful jiggling coins at first and, well, turned into those clanging judge and jury coins instead. Maybe took that belt, took that same belt, flipped it over a tree branch, one end tied a noose, put it around his neck, tightened it, tightened it, and then slid his feet off of the rock he was on, and as he fell, the noose tightened, his neck broke, and he died. That's the tragedy of Judas Iscariot, because Judas Iscariot really could have been Saint Judas. Jesus did die on the cross to pay for all sin, including Judas's betrayal sin. If the solution that was offered to Judas you see to that, that's your responsibility. If that's the only solution that there is to sin, then there would be no reason for us to be here right now. And I'm not just talking about being in church or, or listening to a video. There's no reason for us to exist, period. We might just as well give up like Judas did. But God has provided us with a solution. And how thankful we have to be that God has provided us with a solution. You know, not far from where Judas ended his life, Jesus was being sentenced to die on Mount Calvary, where he would die and pay for the sins of the world, including Judas's sin, all of our sins, paying for all of the sins of the world, where he would take upon himself the responsibility of paying for our sins for us. See, now that's God's solution to the problem of our sins. He took care of our sins for us. The tragic demise of Judas well, it teaches us what to remember when we're seized with remorse. 
we kind of have to start where Judas started here, of course. We, like Judas, have to come to a, a clear understanding of our sin and what we deserve because of our sin. Actually, Christianity makes no sense at all without that understanding of our sin. But we don't have to end where Judas ended. Judas found a horrible solution, which was no solution at all for his sin. And no one has to have that solution because the blood of Jesus shed on the Mount Calvary, he paid for, like I said, the sins of the world, for all sins, no matter how great or small they may seem to be. Like Judas, we have sinned. But there is no need for us or for anyone to despair because through Christ, through faith in Christ, we do have forgiveness. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith with the second article and its meaning. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Let's, let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, when we think of Judas and his tragic solution to the problem of his sin, well, we confess that like Judas, we have sinned, we deserve your wrath and punishment, but how thankful we are that we can look to the cross and see Jesus our Savior and know that there he paid for all of our sins. Help us always to see the seriousness of our sins. But then also, please help us always to rejoice in the amazing greatness of our Savior's redemptive work for us, for the fact that he paid for all our sins. We don't have to say that's our responsibility. Jesus took that responsibility upon himself. We're forgiven because of the blood of Christ. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. And we gather up all of the prayers we have as we join in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining me for our Ash Wednesday worship. The Lord bless and keep you always. Amen.